Democratic backsliding isn't limited to weak governments abroad. Today's guest warns about the dangers facing American democracy, including the growing acceptance of intimidation and even political violence in some communities. She's Rachel Kleinfeld, this week on Story in the Public Square. and welcome to a Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. And I'm G. Wayne Miller with the Providence Journal. This week, we're joined by Dr. Rachel Kleinfeld, who is a senior fellow in the Democracy, Conflict, and Governance Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. She joins us today from New Mexico. Rachel, so great to see you. Wonderful to see you, Jim. You know, uh, I, I read a lot of your recent articles to get ready for this conversation today, and these are not lift, you know, pick-me-ups. This is, this is some <laughs> really serious, heavy stuff. Um, break down for us, though, starting at that global scale. What's happening to democracy globally? So um, democracy globally, after World War II, was very uh, moderate. There just weren't that many countries that were democracies. And in the 90s, they skyrocketed. So we got just a vast explosion of democracies. What's been happening for the last 16 years is what's called a democratic recession. So globally, we're losing democracies. And actually, we just passed this year the mark at which more people are now living in countries that are partially free or not free at all, um, as opposed to democracies. And that's a real setback. It's a real um, reduction in freedom, but not just freedom, because democracy is strongly correlated with economic growth, with girls going to school, all sorts of positive things that um, are slipping backward. Well, and so we're going to want to talk a little bit about America in some specific context, but do you have a sense of what's driving the democratic recession globally? There's a lot of theories. Some people say that a lot of countries became democracies that probably didn't have some of the underlying ability to be ready. Um, that makes sense, except that we're seeing a lot of slip back in countries that have all of those underlying conditions, places like Hungary, India, America, Poland. So that probably accounts for some of it, but not all of it. We seem to be in a moment in which global um, authoritarian forces are learning a lot from each other and are learning how to undermine more democratic systems. And so that's also seeming to be some portion of it. And then I think the last part is probably that um, as kleptocracy has grown, as corruption has grown, it undermines people's faith in their own systems and they actually vote away their own democracies because they feel like what they're getting in terms of freedom isn't worth what they're losing in terms of trust and so on. So it's a mixed bag. So if you can turn to what's happening to American democracy, give us an overview of, say, the last 10 years and then where we are today. Uh, we're in a midterm election year. So give us that overview, if you wouldn't mind, Rachel. Sure. So I think for those of us who are of a certain age, we need to kind of reset our minds. A lot has happened since 2000. We basically had a situation before 2000 where... People voted based on their beliefs and their partisan interests, but since then, what we've had is a lot of voting that's negative, that's against their um, the other side rather than for their side. We've seen a real reduction in the strength of our democratic institutions starting in 2000, but speeding up a lot in the last five years. And um, we've seen a contraction of uh, understanding of people on the other side, of openness to um, switching sides to taking other ideas into account. So really strict party line voting, weakening institutions. And all of this is being uh, is causing international indices to downgrade America. Pretty much every international indice from Freedom House, where I sit on the board, to uh, varieties of democracy have been downgrading America quite significantly uh, since 2000, but really in the last five years a lot. So, Rachel, what are the forces at play that are driving these trends, both internationally and, and here domestically in the United States? So, globally, we're seeing um, we're at a height of immigration uh, after 2015, and immigration 
it seems to be driving um, backlash. People are concerned. They feel like their societies aren't homogenous anymore. Um, the autocratic revolution, the ability of Russia and China, particularly to, um, but also Iran, to interfere in our own systems, not just America, all over the world, they're interfering in democratic systems and they're using it. Um, they're not just changing votes. What they're doing is um, getting into our news feeds, helping us understand the world in a way that's much more polarizing, much more partisan. So those are some of the global forces. Also, the economy is, is since 2008 and the major recession that the whole world experienced in 2008, it led to more populist parties, more outsider candidates. And some of those people um, are running against the current system that's bad, but some of them are also pretty egocentric and running for themselves and tend to concentrate power in themselves and harm institutions of democracy. So whether they're good or bad, they almost always tend to harm democratic institutions. In America, the other trend that's been going on, well, too, one is that the parties are extraordinarily close. We haven't seen parties contest power for Congress and so on this closely since Reconstruction. And that means that every election matters a lot because you could have control of Congress. So you're going to fight to the death for every election. The other thing that's been happening and sped up since 2000 is a homogenization of the Republican Party and a heterogenization of the Democratic Party. Basically, people used to be uh, less identifiable as Democratic or Republican. You could be a white working class man who was unionized, who held pretty conservative views about a lot of things, went to church, but voted Democratic because you were in the union and vice versa on the Republican side. That's virtually gone now. Now the Republican Party is much more white, much more male, much more conservative ideologically than it used to be, um, much more homogenous. Meanwhile, the Democrats have picked up everybody else, so it's much more heterogeneous. What we find in other countries is that when you get a homogenous party, they tend to play on those identity factors because it's easier to unite your party around identity than around policy. So we're seeing more uh, kind of racial and other factors coming in on the Republican side that are driving identity markers. On the Democratic side, you are seeing some of that, but because there's such a heterogeneous party, they have to they have to appeal to a lot of different groups to, to win a majority. So it's it's different in different constituencies. You know, Rachel, you and I are contemporaries. We were both 15 years ago running around Washington, D.C., working in the same general space. You know, I, you said something that just resonated with me. You talked about parties being so closely uh, aligned that they, in terms of their, their, their support that they can test the, these, these, these elections on sort of in language that's do or die. It, it's, it's the death of the republic if one side or the other wins. How dangerous is that kind of framing? It, are, are we over uh, inflating the stakes and thereby making you know, the, the, the decay of democracy uh, more likely? Uh, is the way we talk about it that has something to do with what's happening here? Uh, there's a lot of questions in there. Let me unpack them. So yes, the way we talk about it really matters. Um, we are not entirely wrong to frame it that way, but let me let me unpack it a little. So because the parties have moved into such different demographic uh, spaces, they've also moved quite far in their um, ideological spaces. So there used to be a lot of overlap between conservative Democrats and liberal Republicans, especially when you had the blue dog Democrats, you had the Southern Democrats who are kind of holdovers from the Jim Crow era, and you had these Rockefeller Republicans. So voting for a Republican didn't necessarily mean voting for a slate of policies that a normal Democrat would disagree with. The centers were actually fairly uh, overlapping. That's changed vastly in 20 years. So now the Republicans are very far right, and the, the um, left, the Democrats have moved somewhat to the left. It's not a symmetric, it's asymmetric, but both sides have moved to some degree. So um, it is more existential in that way. People are right to feel like the other party is going to change policies quite a bit, whereas in the past, that wouldn't have been the case. On the other hand, there's a lot of research that shows that leaders who use rhetoric um, that dehumanizes their opponents and so on amp up violence. And we're seeing a lot of violence in America, uh, not quite at the levels of the 1970s and late 60s, but getting there. And that kind of leadership rhetoric that paints the other side as uh, 
evil, as less than human, as a, a threat to the Republic is incredibly dangerous um, from that perspective. Well, let's talk about that political violence because you, are, you have been sounding the alarm about the rise of political violence in the United States. What are you seeing and what are you worried about? So unfortunately, I think a lot of people think, oh, there was January 6th and you know, whatever you think about January 6th, it's over. That's not what the statistics show. So what the statistics show is that uh, white supremacist activity is 12 times higher than it was five years ago. Uh, we're getting 13, more than 13 incidents a day of kind of major white supremacist organizing, whereas it used to be less than one a day. Um, and it's also much more public, things like unfurling sheets on major highway bypasses and, and so on, not kind of in the shadows. Uh, members of Congress are getting 10 times more death threats than they were when Trump took office. Um, and you're hearing people like Fred Upton, the Republican um, House member who's, who's leaving, saying those death threats are affecting their votes. They're making it very hard to vote in a bipartisan way. They're scaring people. They're causing people, especially parents with kids of both genders, but parents with kids who get these death threats, they're often against their children. And sometimes they'll say, you know, we know where you live, but they do know where you live, they'll dox them. So what you're seeing is a withdrawal from the public sphere of certain people. And then on the, on the local level, it's also quite bad. I think that I'm going to get this study wrong. It was the, um, the National League of Cities, I think, took a poll before 2020, which was when violence skyrocketed. And 13% of mayors said that they'd had death threats. Um, a newer poll post-2020 shows that 81% of local elected officials have faced physical violence or, or uh, significant intimidation. And it's not all online. Um, we used to never have threats against election workers, for instance. Now the DOJ has had 850 filed threats. 50% of election workers say they don't bother to file because they don't think anything will happen. And 50% also say they're in person, these like threats against their physicality. So, you know, it's not like you get paid a lot to be an election worker and it's not a very glorious job. If you're getting that kind of feedback, you're likely to quit. And our election workers, our elections are highly local and they're very specific to, you know, esoteric old computer technology or new computer technology. Most of those people, the median um, length of stay is 12 to 15 years. The big cities usually have people who've been in those jobs for 25 years. So when they leave, it's a huge loss of knowledge to our republic. And it, it's not just elections either. You know, we've seen in, in this part of the country and around the country, small cities, small towns, school committees that used to be peaceful where people show up and, and there are threats or actual violence. We've seen this certainly during COVID. Talk about that. It isn't necessarily, it isn't only at the congressional level where, where these threats and intimidation are undermining democracy. It, it's in many instances at a very local hometown level. Talk about that because I find that chilling too. So you're absolutely right, Wayne. That's exactly right. First of all, the election officials often are local. You know, they're your neighbors that are that are sitting at the poll taking your ID and so on. But you're absolutely right that school boards are seeing a huge increase. Public health officials, 80% of Colorado's public health officials say that they've been threatened. Um, you're seeing a huge uh, group of public health officials leave, probably the greatest ever in our country's recorded history of one year loss of public health officials. What, we see, what we're seeing is these groups are being targeted for political reasons. You're seeing kind of campaigns that are national against these local school board officials or what have you to, to amp up usually culture war issues. But we're also seeing that extremist groups, groups like the Proud Boys, Three Percenters, militia groups, are piggybacking on that mainstream concern and are showing up at these events. And then you've been in maybe concert crowd or something, there's kind of a feeling of a crowd. So you get a couple of violent folks in a crowd egging people on and a crowd that might've been angry but not violent becomes more violent. So that's what we're seeing at this local level. And you're right that it's all over the country. It's in blue and red states. Um, and it's very much affecting uh, real people, just regular people. Rachel, do you have a sense is, so I mean, the groups that you've mentioned, we know that they have real organizational structure, the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, uh, groups like that. But do you have a sense that the, that the adoption of violence as a political tactic is, is, it, is, it, is, this, a sh is this just learned from experience? Is, is there some plan or strategy behind it? Is there, is there what's, what's going on? Uh, 
So America, first of all, has a long history of political violence. And when we look at other countries, you look for that history because there's a lot of correlation between past use and present use. So we had the Know Nothing Party, we had the Reconstruction period, we had lynching through the 60s, actually, that um, after Brown v. Board and so on. So we have this history, unfortunately, and then the assassination of multiple presidential candidates in the 60s. And um, what we're seeing now is a, a very a big change in, in violence. So most violence all over the world is committed by young men. Um, young men who tend to be unmarried, childless, often without jobs, they often have criminal history. That's who commits violence everywhere, and they often age out of it, frankly. But that's also in America who commits spontaneous hate crimes. Um, but what we're seeing now is a group on the right, uh, and the right, by the way, is just skyrocketing in its violence if you look at the global terrorism database. The left is growing, but not as fast. On the right, what we're seeing is a mainstreaming of violence for political reasons. So you're seeing middle-aged men who are married with kids and jobs, often good jobs, often college degrees, um, who are showing up at violent Stop the Steal events at the January 6th insurrection. That's really worrisome because it shows that violence is becoming a political tactic of the mainstream. On the left, we're seeing violence from people who identify less with the Democratic Party, who are um, young, often white progressive, kind of you know your, your typical uh, angry young man from college sort of thing. Um, that's where we're seeing the most violence on the left. But on the right, it's this highly established group and it's people who identify more with the Republican Party. So because of that asymmetry, on the right, it's more easy to harness the violence for political purposes. On the left, it's very hard to harness the violence for political purposes because these people are disaffected with the Democratic Party. If, <clears throat> excuse me, is there any way to counter these trends? I mean, as you noted, there, this country has a long history of violence. I mean, going back to the founding and, and, and of course, even before the founding. Is, is there anything that can counter these trends? I mean, I'm, I'm always trying to look for solutions and I realize that there's no quick answer or no quick solution to this, but what do you see that might give a, a degree of hope or optimism? So first of all, we're not at a very high level of violence. We have a lot of threats. We have a lot of intimidation that has effects politically, even without violence, but it's at a low level. That's really good because violence builds on itself. So it means that we can actually do a lot and there's a lot we can do. I mean, the most important would be for leaders to take down the rhetoric. The research on leadership rhetoric is, is just solid and it shows that followers follow their leaders. They wanna be kind of part of a social norm that of what's acceptable or not. So um, reducing the dehumanizing, reducing the level of anger, the, the rhetoric, the campaign ads that show people in gun, ha gun you know, gunshot hairs and so on, reducing all that would help a lot. Another thing that would help is just in our communities, um, resetting the norms. You can be really angry. You can't use violence. You can't use intimidation. You can't dox people. You know, there's just rules of democracy. And the more that our social communities are churches and our mayors and our local uh, areas. Our local areas are the most trusted. People trust their local politicians the most, despite the threats. The more we reset those norms societally to say, you know, there are certain things that are outside the bounds. We're not going to normalize them, especially with jokes. One of the things that we know is that jokes slip past our mental barriers. So you might say, oh, I'd never believe in assassination, but this is a pretty funny joke about a politician I don't like. I'm going to send it along. That's actually really bad because it, it tends to normalize a certain level of violent rhetoric, which sounds like, oh, it's just a joke. But then as, as what we see in the extremist space is that they use jokes, they use memes, they use pictures, and it can be really hard to tell whether they're joking or not until a violent activity occurs. And they use that to, first of all, hide culpability, but second of all, to slip past your brain's um, ability to kind of tell whether something's wrong or not, because jokes are supposed to be a little wrong. That's what makes them funny is that they're a little wrong. So um, th that kind of thing is particularly dangerous and we should be careful about spreading, you know, just a joke. Yeah, uh, Rachel, you, uh, in a recent article for the Journal of Democracy, you identified four risk factors for political violence. And it, we won't tick through them all now, but a lot of them seem to apply to the United States uh, quite clearly. Uh, but one in particular, you noted uh, weak institutional constraints of violence, particularly security sector bias toward one group. What is the role of security sector bias in the United States? And are you concerned about erosion in that area as well? 
Yeah, so internationally, what we see is that if one group, whether it's an ethnic group or a partisan group or what have you, thinks that they won't be arrested or won't be prosecuted, that they're going to be okay if they commit a certain level of violence, they're more likely to commit violence if they're egged on by their leaders. If they're egged on by their leaders and they think that they're going to face repercussions, they're much less likely to commit violence. Um, you know, that stands to reason. It's also what the research shows. So when the security sector leans to one side, it's a strong indication to people that they're not going to be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. And it makes violence much more likely. We see that in places like India. Um, what we're seeing in America is, uh, you know, our security institutions have always been um, conservative, small c conservative. It's, it's a kind of conservative profession set, but actually quite bipartisan if you look at political giving um, you know, unions are part of policing in many, many cities, so that has cut across partisan belief. What we've been seeing in the last couple of years is, is a growing hardening of the security sector and a growing sense that their main threat comes from the left, even though all the research shows that the, the greater level of violence is coming from the right. And so what we're seeing is uh, in cities, like Albuquerque, just to the south of us here, um, had a militia event where the militia showed up with uh, guns to a rally. And there's footage of the police kind of going over to the militia and sort of treating them as if they were part of the same side. You're seeing that in a number of cities, uh, selfies at the Capitol and so on. That sends a message to people, especially when it's repeated on TikTok and on social media and so on, they take those clips, that um, it's okay to commit violence. You're not going to be prosecuted. And it's why the rule of law and accountability for these actions is so important and why we need um, all levels of government because you don't want just the federal government to do all the work. There will be a backlash. So you really need state and local governments to step up. And unfortunately, in some places, we're seeing um, that not, not occur. So we are in a midterm election year. We primaries coming up, depending on where you are, at the end of the summer, early fall, and then, of course, the general elections in November. What do you foresee, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but what do you foresee in terms of political violence uh, associated with elections? This is the first election we've had since uh, President Biden was elected. So uh, the good news is that I'm not expecting much violence at these elections. The bad news is, is that that's because I don't think they're going to be very close. Um, I think that you know most of the polling shows that Republicans are likely to win, uh, that means that the campaign rhetoric is less likely to gin up anger because um, if, if, if you're not so worried, then you don't need to, to do that. And so there's probably not going to be significant violence. There might be some intimidation, but what we're seeing in America is what we see in other countries, which is that electoral playing fields are set long before the election. It's only really weak democracies that are very new that use violence or intimidation close to an election. It's just too obvious. Um, what you often see is years before uh, setting the playing field, changing the rules, making it harder for opponents to run, uh, using intimidation to take your most popular opponents out, things like that. We're seeing that in the United States already. So I don't expect much at the midterms. 2024 might be a very different story, um, but the reasons are not great. Uh, Rachel, uh, what do you say to those who argue that the left wing, uh, left, the left in American politics needs to start organizing militias of their own because of the rise of, of, of right wing militias in the United States? It's a super bad idea. It is happening <laughs> to some extent, um, uh, very small, but it is happening. And it's just a horrible idea, not just because I don't like violence, but because what all the research internationally shows is that nonviolent movements toward democracy for greater democracy tend to succeed. They, they tend to succeed because they get broad groups of people across partisanship, across society together who say, I want to be a part of that. And they take their kids and they take, you know, everybody to the, goes to the rallies and they say, we believe in democracy and kumbaya. As soon as a violent wing comes up that um, is on that same side, first of all, it scares away the parents with the kids and a lot of the people from the other side who had joined, from the other partisan side that joined say, oh, there's violence, they're bad, and so we're going to pull away. And so you lose your coalition. And as you lose your coalition, you're also giving uh, am figurative ammunition to the other side to paint uh, your side as the instigator. 
Um, and that's very common. And actually it's a strategy of a lot of white nationalist groups to get the left to instigate so they can retaliate. And so um, for all those reasons, it's just really dumb. Rachel, we've got about 90 seconds left here, and you know there are voices you hear periodically uh, over the years that warned of a coming civil war uh, in the United States, and those voices seem to be growing in number now, and I'm curious again in about the, the last minute that we have here, how concerned are you uh, about the prospect of some new civil war in America's not-so-distant future? I'm not at all worried. But that's because the violence doesn't look like a civil war. When we picture a civil war, we picture both sides fighting it out you know, in the streets like, like in the 1860s. What we're seeing is violence um, on the left that's just very unfocused and not being used for particular purposes. And on the right, we're seeing violence that's quite focused around elections. It rises and falls in 2016, 2018, 2020. Um, and it's really about taking control of government. That's not what a civil war looks like. You don't get civil wars generally in um, well-established rich democracies. They're, they're vanishingly rare. So what you get is people trying to take over the government using these kinds of techniques. And, and that's what we're likely to, to continue seeing, um, but not the kind of street fighting that, um, you know, it's not Portland writ large kind of thing. We're going to take that as a hopeful way to end this episode. Uh, Rachel Kleinfeld, thank you so much for being with us today. That is all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org where you can always uh, catch up on old episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.